When it comes to the big data revolution, our guest tonight, Alex Pentland, he goes by Alex, his father is also Alex, might be considered the Albert Einstein of his era. Over years of groundbreaking experiments, Professor Pentland, who founded and directs MIT's Human Dynamics Laboratory, has distilled remarkable discoveries significant enough to become the bedrock of a whole new scientific field called social physics. Listen to these alkaloids. Newsweek magazine has named Alex as one of the 100 Americans likely to shape this century. Forbes magazine recognized him as one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world. His research has been featured in Nature, Science, and Harvard Business Review. He's appeared on television features for BBC World, Discover, and Science Channels. Last week in Switzerland, Dr. Pendlin moderated the World Economic Forum where he co-leads his big data and personal data initiatives. After joining the MIT faculty in 1996, Alex helped create and direct MIT's Media Laboratory. The Media Asia Laboratories at the Indian Institute of Technology and Strong Hospital Center for Future Health. He's a founding member of the advisory boards for Nissan, Motorola Mobility, and a variety of startup firms. His research group and entrepreneurship program has spun off more than 30 companies to date. He's a pioneer in organizational engineering, mobile information systems, and computational social science. His amazing work provides organizations with better management tools and better ways to interact with their customers. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sandy Petlin. Thank you. Good. And I dance, but I don't sing. Um, thank you <laughs> for braving the rain and coming here tonight. And what I want to tell you about is um, some of the things that we've been doing that I think that make this one of the most exciting periods of time uh, in your life or, in fact, possibly in, in many centuries. And uh, what it is, is, let's see if we can make this thing work. Technology is always tough. Um, it's a thing I call social physics. And I'm, I'm going to talk about two things today. One is I'm going to talk about who we are. So Jane Goodall, I guess, is coming later in this series. Um, she watches apes. I watch people. Uh, she watches it with her eyeballs and a notepad. I watch people with big data. And what we try to do is we try to understand the nature of the being and the nature of the society. And that's what I want to talk to you about because I think there's a huge revolution that is underway there that's paying attention to. The second thing uh, I want to talk about is how we should live. Because the more we know about ourselves, the more we know how to engineer our society how to conduct ourselves, how to make creative societies, how to build innovation, and things like that. So those are the two things. Who are we as humans, and what is a natural way for us to live? So here, whoops, go back. So here's the uh, sort of thing that's going on that uh, you probably haven't thought about. So everyone's heard about big data. It's all the scary stuff, right? Um, and you're right, it is really scary, but it's really interesting from a social science point of view. And I make this little diagram just to sort of give you a sense. So along the bottom is how long experiments in social science last. So that's economics, it's medicine, political science. And you know, ones that are way over there last 50 years. Things like the Framingham Heart Study or the Nurses Study, where you study tens of thousands of people for generations and you look at health outcomes. But in those studies, they only talk to people about every three years, and they only ask them a few questions, take a couple of blood samples. So the amount of information they have per unit time is about zero. Um, and that means they don't have the context for this. So all these guys are getting high cholesterol. Well, they don't know what they ate during the intervening three years. They don't know whether they exercise. There's all sorts of stuff they have no clue about. And similarly, if you look at most of the social science we have today, it's done by freshmen sitting in those seats with little surveys, right? And how do you feel about the, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's nice, but you know, that's not the real world, folks. 
And what I've done in the last several years is try to get closer to Jed Goodall. So what I do is I build little name badges. And under human subjects law, so we pay people and so forth, but we ask people to wear the little name badges for a month. And we don't do it on students. We do it often banks and call centers and drug discovery parts of uh, pharmacies, uh, of, dr of uh, drug companies and so forth. And um, those are those things with a circle in the middle. So we collect data about where people are, where they talk, their tone of voice, their gesture for a month. And then we compare it to things like, are they being productive? Are they being happy? Are they stressed out? Are they being creative? And we do the best we can to compare behavior to all the things that we really care about. And that's big data. Because while we watch people for a month, we collect thousands of measurements about tone of voice and who they talk to every minute. It's huge. Now, we don't ever listen to content because that freaks people out. And it's not realistic to, to think about wanting a society where there's people listening to your words all the time. But as social science, this makes sense. We also do things with phones. So we mug the phones. So we put little software in there. People know it's there. They get paid for it. They opt in. They can opt out and have their data destroyed anytime they want. But I will go into a community and give everybody in the community a smartphone. And we pay them. And what we get in return is we get a sense of who talks to who, where do they go, how much do they exercise. Um, we, they give us their master charge bill so we know what they buy. They give us the uh, key to their uh, uh, Facebook account so we know what they do on Facebook. In some cases, we actually give them little sleep aids so we can look at their EEG at night. That's yeah, pretty amazing, but all under human subjects. Don't worry about the privacy yet, <laughs> okay? And what we get is we get this incredibly rich picture of how people communicate with each other. A picture you've never seen before, never imagined even. It is hundreds of times, thousands of times richer than any social science that's been done before. And it's relevant in a way that's scary. Uh, and the relevant in the way that's scary is, is that the things that we do as part of an experiment are the things that our society is moving to as part of everyday life. That's the threat of big data. And the, the positive part of it is, is understanding us more. So that's the theme. So what do we discover here? Well, one of the things we discover is that, oops, People are much more a function of the people they interact with than they are of the things between their ears. If I know what the people around you are doing, I know very well what you're doing, almost always. Not completely, there is free will, but almost always. The big change in social science is that you go from something that's qualitative to something that's quantitative. We can actually write down equations that predict how many people will do what? Which ideas will take off? How productive will this group be? There, there are equations. You can solve them. You can predict things. You can engineer stuff if you want. Talk about scary. Okay? Um, and we discovered that the way that we talk about ourselves is fundamentally wrong in several ways. So one way that's wrong is that we think of ourselves as conscious, rational beings, or maybe not so rational. But in fact, most of what we do is habitual. And that habitual behavior is mostly governed and learned from the people around us. So when we see peers doing something that looks successful, we almost unconsciously absorb it. And what the big data tells us is that that's 90 to 95% of our behavior all of the time. So I can predict which app you'll download on your phone. I can predict whether you're going to gain weight. If I know the people you interact with and what's happening to them. And I can do it mathematically. This is not just, oh, I can sort of do it. I can tell you how much. And I discover something else, which is that a source of major confusion, which if you look at the Kahneman diagram, this is from its Nobel Prize 
lecture, the thing that kicked off behavioral economics. People have two ways of thinking, a fast thinking and a slow thinking. This is in his book, that's the title of his most recent book. The slow thinking is what you go to college for. It's the reasoning things through. It's slow. You can't handle a lot of variables. We tend to make mistakes. The fast thinking is the stuff that's our habits, the things that we pick up from other people mostly. And it governs almost all the things we do. It's why we wear similar clothes. It's why we have similar habits, speak similar languages. And we learn very differently in these two things. We read newspapers, we listen to radio, we do all sorts of things to collect facts. That's our conscious way of thinking. It's our slow way of thinking where we piece together our evidence. And um, however, that way of thinking doesn't actually much affect how we act. So you may want to lose weight and say, oh, I'm going to try and eat less. But we all know it's very hard. You may want to stop smoking. It's very hard. All the conscious thinking seems to be very well separated from our habits. So we're very exploratory in looking for facts. And that's the thing we've seen an explosion in our society with the internet, with TV, with radio. But it doesn't actually change behavior very much. What does change behavior is examples from other people being successful, examples that are rich media, face-to-face, -face, sometimes telephone, compelling stories. So if I know that your circle of friends, the people you interact with, not necessarily friends, the people you interact with, are all experimenting with a new way of investing money, a new type of food, things like that, then I can predict with great accuracy how likely you are to pick up that habit. The fact that you read about it in the newspaper here on the radio has very little influence on what you actually do. So this is a fundamental confusion in our society. The rich channels of communication are the things that influence us. And it's the people we interact with that are the, at the other end of that rich channel. And if you count the number of people who you interact with like that, it's not so different now than it was 10,000 years ago. Think about the number of people you actually interact with regularly during the day. It's small. You work with a few people, you have your family, maybe you have a couple friends. Now you may have 10,000 Facebook friends, but as I'll show you, that actually doesn't have much to do with your actual behavior. You may entertain lots of ideas, but you rarely act on them. So another thing that we find from this is when we separate out this pattern of exploration for new ideas and examples that we incorporate into our habits, that we can watch new habits propagate across a society or across a company. So for instance here, this is communication patterns within a German bank over a period of a month. So there's five departments in the bank. Um, the blue stuff is all the electronic communication. The red stuff is face-to-face -face communication patterns. So when you see a little ball over top of one of the little departments, that means they're having a meeting. When you see a big arc between two of the boxes, that means those two departments are meeting with each other or, or just talking a lot in the hall somehow, right? And when you compare the pattern of communication with the productivity of this group, you find something interesting. The electronic stuff doesn't matter at all. All those memos from the boss, nothing, okay? <laughs> what does matter is the pattern of communication face to face. That matters hugely. That accounts for almost 40% of the variance between poorly performing groups and high performing groups. 40% of the variance doesn't sound so big, right? 40% of the variance is the same size of effect as IQ. 40% of the variance is the same size effect as your genome on your health. It's big, okay? And what we see is we see again this pattern of engagement and exploration. So of that 40% of the variation between poorly performing groups and high performing groups, the vast majority of it is what I'm calling engagement, which is talking within the group. 
So if I talk to you and I talk to you, do you two also talk to each other? If all of us are in the loop, then that's high engagement. Having everybody talk to each other, this sounds really sort of stupid, doesn't it, right? Yeah. Having everybody talk to each other is not normal in a lot of groups. And groups that actually have everybody in the loop are systematically higher performing across dozens of organizations. Now, we don't know what these guys are talking about. Maybe they're talking about the football uh, game. It doesn't matter. The other thing that's another 10% of the variance is exploration. Do you get out and talk to people that, you that the boss thinks you should not talk to? Usually in an organization, you have this org chart that says you're supposed to talk to these people but not those people. So to the extent you get out of the org chart and you talk to people that you shouldn't be talking to, that raises your productivity. And the reason is, is that you now get to see your job from the perspective of the sales team or the management team or the janitor. And those perspectives are important to understanding what's going on. Now, in a drug discovery team, those proportions are different. So when we go into a, 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 a drug company and we look at these you know, ACE PhD chemists who are trying to invent new drugs, the most important thing is exploration. That's not talking to other chemists. That's talking to the production people, to the sales people, to the docs, to the execs. It's getting a sense of what is the space that they're operating in. That's the biggest thing. That's the thing that's related to creative output. So, the, sorry about this thing. See if we can make it work. So, the pattern of social time, not the content, the pattern of social ties over rich media, face to face principally, determines the majority of the variation in productive output and creative output. It's people talking to each other, it's ideas banging together. That's what big data tells you. Now, that may sound like something you knew. Your grandmother told you that. Your grandmother probably did tell you that. But then you went to school and you learned all sorts of other theories, right? You learned about specialization and you learned about, you know, uh, cognitive this, that, and the other thing. And it turns out your grandmother was right. Those other things are secondary. So, um, an amusing thing. So, wrote a paper on this in Harvard Business Review, won paper of the year last year. I guess two years ago now. It also won paper year from the Academy of Management. So, the academics liked it and the business people liked it. And that's the first time I think that the two communities have ever agreed about anything. <laughs> so, it actually may have something to it. So these are people moving around in San Francisco. It's data from the Exploratorium, cell phones. The big dots are the most popular places, bars and restaurants in San Francisco. This is actually off of taxi drivers, you know, as they move around in the city. And it looks like a nicely mixed city, right? But if you analyze this city the right way, you discover that there's lots of subgroups. And these subgroups don't talk to each other. They only talk to themselves. Now, you remember what I said about idea flow and about engagement? So if a group of people only talk to themselves, spend time with themselves, they learn from each other, and guess what happens? They become very similar. They learn to like the same fashions. They take the same attitude towards risk. They take the same attitude towards the sports teams. They become very much like each other. From a cognitive point of view, they're trying to fit in or they're trying to you know, get ahead. Uh, and so that's why they're learning from each other. But the point is, is I can now take a city and I can ad identify how ideas flow around in that city. And once I know that, I can do things like, for instance, I can talk to the people. Oh, let's uh, see. We're going to be careful. So you find that fashion is different in the different groups. One group likes little red dresses. The other likes black dresses. You find that one group has a very odd attitude towards risk, and they tend not to pay back credit cards. All right. It's just the attitude. And it's the whole group. They learn from it. They learn this attitude. So for a company that, like, for instance, wants all of its employees to work at Starbucks, what you're doing is you're teaching your employees to live the Starbucks way. You're losing the company culture. You might want to think about that. A more interesting thing is, is that there are subtle ways in the people live that they learn from each other in these groups that are critically important in long-term disease, like diabetes. 
like congestive heart failure, other surgeries, alcoholism. There's no one specific thing that makes them at higher risk for this. It's the fact that they adopt ways of behaving that as an ensemble leads them to have often five times the risk of, say, diabetes of people who have the same genetic background but slightly different habits of behavior. They're a member of a different tribe. They'll learn from different people. And that's a pretty amazing thing. And we have had a couple startup companies that make use of that. So let's see if we can do this again. So this is something that I think is maybe one of the big messages here. When I go to places like Davos and I talk to all these uppy up people, um, what I find is I find that everybody talks about society in this framework that came from Adam Smith and John Locke. Okay, they talk about individuals. So in economics, what is it? Well, you have people making up their mind about what they want and you apply money incentives to them, they change their behavior, right? But that's not what social physics says. What the data, when we can really look at behavior says is, we are much more members of a group than we are members of what goes on between our heads, between our ears. So in other words, treating people as individual is a mistake. And you say, well, also what difference does that make? Well, ask yourself, where do fads come from? Where do economic bubbles come from? Oh, it's from people talking to each other. It's from people copying each other. It's from these manias that develop. Those are not economic things. They're not about individuals. They're about peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And in fact, Adam Smith knew this. So this quote is not from the Wealth of Nations, which most people think it is. It's from Moral Sentiments. And the rest of the quote is, it's human nature to exchange not only goods, but ideas, assistance, and favors. These exchanges guide the creation of solutions for the good of the community. So what Adam Smith was saying is that it's the learning from each other, the exchanges of interactions, etc., between people, that is the thing that causes economic incentives to be divided up fairly. In the essence, what he's saying is that economic incentives, economic opportunity is weaker than the social fabric. And that's what we find when we look at the data. The social fabric dominates our behavior. That's why when you give somebody, for instance, a raise, but all the people around them still are pushing in the same direction, most people won't actually respond to the economic incentive, to the raise. They'll cheat it somehow. There's all sorts of things where economic incentives do not work whenever they're put against social incentives. And so it's a different way of thinking. It's a way, I think, that is far more social, um, and you can do stuff with it. So you might ask, why did we evolve to be social creatures like this? Why is it that the exchanges we have with each other, trading ideas, this idea flow, why is this more important than rational choice about what's good for me? Let me show you an example. So this is a community of 1.6 million social traders. So they're selling dollars and euros and gold and things like that. And it's unusual because it's an open community. It's like Twitter or something like that. And I can look at the trades that any of these 1.6 million people do. And so what people do is they look at the people that are making money, the people that are like them, they see what they're trading, they, they look for advice from the community. And when they see things they like, then they can allocate some of their money to follow that guy or to follow that woman over there. So what they're doing is a sort of a peer group of financial advisors, sort of an interesting idea, okay? And you can ask, what pattern of social learning, what pattern of interacting with other people yields the best profits, causes the best decisions? And if I show you something like this, a little hard to see here, but there's this sort of circle at the bottom, those are people that are going it alone. They're reading the newspapers, they're not following other people. They're trying to make up their own mind. And there's another community up the top, which is sort of crazy social. You know, I follow you, you follow her, she follows me. Oh, wait a second. 
That's not so good. If it goes around in circles, that's called a bubble, right? So there's other parts of the community that are, there's no new ideas there. They're all the same ideas going around and around. And in the middle, there's people that are, have very diverse sources of information, of social information. And it turns out that if you look at the profitability of these guys, sorry, you can write down, first of all, an equation that says, how many new ideas are these people exposed to? Different strategies of investing by tracing all these paths of copying and social interaction. And you get this thing I call idea flow. When it's low, people don't make much money. In fact, they're market neutral. That means they're about chance, okay? When they're up in that echo chamber where they're all following each other madly, they make not very much money, and occasionally they all go bust. Not so good. In the middle, we have diverse sets of information from other people, diverse social learning. You make 30% more profit than the average. 30% is pretty good, right? And it's reliable. In fact, we have a mechanism now. We do help several funds with hedging. You might be interested. Um, because we can pick out which trades the community believes are the correct ones every couple minutes. You just look at the pattern of people, and when you find people that have very diverse sources of information, they tend to make good decisions, you follow them. And it works millions of times. Okay? And you see it in lots of other things, too. And I'll show you some of those other things. So if the social fabric is so powerful and it evolved to make us smart, what do we do when we want to change the behavior of a part of society, like for instance, to have us all lose weight or stop smoking or something like that, or all make better choices. Um, well, what people try to do, what our governance talks about, is they talk about economic incentives. So if you want people to lose weight, you give them some money or you penalize them so that they'll lose weight, or if you want them to do some other activity, you, you give them an incentive, right? An individual incentive. But what I've tried to argue here and show you is that individual decisions, individual thought, is weaker than the learning from other people. The social ties dominate. So instead of giving people individual incentives, why don't we stretch the social fabric? So what I've done is a variety of experiments where I don't give incentives to people, I give incentives to their buddies. So if I want to change your behavior, I give her an incentive to change your behavior. I give her an incentive to change your behavior. And you know what they do? They bug you. And you know what happens? You change your behavior. And what's interesting is, just like normal economics, you can write down the equations. You should remember, I'm talking like English, and all the way with my hand, there are actually equations. You can solve the equations. You can find optimal reward for these sort of things. If you solve those equations, what you find is that pattern, go back, that pattern of incenting the relationship and not the individual will be at least twice as efficient or twice as powerful as economic incentives. So what I'm talking about here is, is the way we've built our society is on this notion of completely isolated individuals. But the truth is, is that we're part of a social fabric. Now, the reason that idea of individuals has dominated is, first of all, it was a good way to get rid of the king, okay? And so that was pretty successful. And it's not a bad first order theory if people have time to think and there's not a lot of interaction. But in today's world, it's a pretty pathetic theory. And what we need is to be able to account for the social fabric along with the individual free will. And I'm going to show you how you can do that in a couple of ways. So for instance, here's an example. Uh, we took a canton in Switzerland. It's like a small state. Um, and um, they were trying to save energy because they get most of their energy from hydro. But when they exceed a certain level, they have to fire up the diesel generators. And diesel in mountain air is like not a good thing. It's also very expensive. So they had tried raising the price advertising campaigns, all sorts of stuff, essentially nothing worked. And this is true all over the world. Getting people to 
cooperate for this sort of tragedy of the commons is famously impossible to do unless you apply really heavy-handed economic incentives. So what we did is we did social incentives, social network incentives, where we did is we signed people up as buddies. So you would sign up to your energy company with her as a buddy, and we would give her, uh, they're actually little, they're not brownie points, they're little bear points. The, the, the animal for the state is a little bear. So you get bear points that are worth about a penny each, okay, when she changed her behavior. Okay, and for a budget of about fifty cents per person per week, we were able to reduce energy use by seventeen percent. Now, the equivalent. There have been some times when people have used economic incentives to get that big a change. It involves doubling the price of energy, and we did it for fifty cents a week. That's pretty good. Or here's another one. Ah, quick. Okay, another one. I took a community area, and I wanted them to behave more healthy. I wanted them to be more active during the winter. If you've ever been to Boston, you know the tendency is you, you close the door, you get under the blanket, you just sit there, right? You know? So you want to be able to run around. And I did a balanced experiment where in one case, on their phone, I measured for them how much they got around. And if they were more active than last week, they got some money. And then in another condition, if they were more active, their buddy got the money. Kind of everybody had a buddy, so everybody was in the game. And interestingly, everybody signed up. There were not people that thought this was too weird. And what happened was we were able to change people's behavior with between four and eight times dollar efficiency in the social condition than in the economic condition. So in other words, we got four times to eight times the bang for buck when we rewarded the buddy rather than the person. Moreover, when we ran out of money, and we're just a university, so we ran out of money all the time, um, it stuck. People kept their activity level high, whereas in the economic incentive group, they stopped immediately, got the blanket out, and disappeared. Okay? Interesting. Or here, this is another one. This is done by a friend of mine. He worked with Facebook in the 2010 elections, sent out 61 million messages to get out the vote. Um, and then had a whole series of controls to tell whether people really did it. So the message is to get out the vote. So remember about rich media versus abstract media? The message to get out the vote did essentially nothing. A few people changed and actually voted. When they did, they were supposed to click I vote, okay? And their face would appear to all their Facebook friends, okay? So surely that would do something, right? No essentially nothing, except for one class of Facebook friends. The Facebook friends for whom you have face-to-face -face relationships, which he measured by saying, do you have photographs of the two of you in the same spot? Those people, I voted by showing the face, caused a cascade of getting out the vote. A person who pushed I, I voted typically got two to three other face-to-face -face friends to vote. None of the Facebook friends, and remember the Facebook message didn't do much. These are different channels of communication. This goes back to the fast and slow thinking. I can tell you messages till the cows come home. You won't get out and vote. But if the people you interact with go vote, and they know that you haven't voted, you're in trouble. You're going to go out and vote, right? That's the way it works. Behavior change comes from examples from your peers, the people you interact with, over rich media. Here's another example. So you remember about the information flow and the financial traders? So what happens when we find our financial traders in an echo chamber and they're all about to go broke and it's a little bad? It's bad for the guy who owns the platform. It's bad for them. And so we tried a couple things. We tried economics. And we'll give you a $20 coupon if you pay attention to the best traders rather than these guys that you're paying to now. That actually helps a little bit. It break it up a little bit. They made 2% more money. And then we tried these social incentives, which is we picked people, random people, 
that would do the best job of breaking up the bubble. Okay, gave him $20 coupon to do that. It doubled the return on investment for the community. And everybody made a lot of money. It was good. <laughs> okay. Um, so what can you do with this? Well, here's an interesting thing. Um, what I've showed you is that it, the evidence that I've collected says that it's the flow of ideas, the rich channels of communication that are the source of learning, behavior change, and innovation. It's not, you know, specialization, it's not classes, you know, and means of production, it's not education level. Well, guess what we can do? We can, in real time, map the pattern of interaction between people. This thing that the science says ought to be the thing that generates innovation, GDP, creative output. So this is Mexico City. You can't read it, but it is Mexico City. And up here, the heat map there shows, and if we can get it to go again. Yes, okay. So the heat map shows the mixing between different communities at different days. Got that? So if it's all just people from the same community, it's yellow. If it's people from different communities, or lots of different communities, then it's bright red. It's different on Sundays and Saturdays and Mondays and Tuesdays. But you can see the places which where the ideas bang together. Okay? And what the science says is this ought to be the places that generate and generate GDP. And you don't need to worry about Big Brother here, because this is just looking at cell towers. Right? We're not looking at any individual, we're asking how many people from this area are in this area. That's all we know. Okay? But we can do amazing things. So, for instance, one of my former students, Nathan Eagle, looked at this measure in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, they have things uh, that are called councils. So every neighborhood has an administrative unit called a council that keeps track of socioeconomic indicators. How many babies died? What's the crime rate? What's the life expectancy? What's the GDP? Turns out all those things co-vary. You know, more babies die, higher crime rate. That's the way it works, okay? And from this measure that I just showed you, that's the thing along the bottom, I can tell you how many babies die very accurately. I can tell you the crime rate very accurately. I can tell you the GDP very accurately. That's pretty amazing, because the only data we have in this country is from the census, which is years and years old, right? And we don't know how good it is anyhow. Or this one, I talked the, uh, helped talk the, the carrier Orange into releasing the same data for the Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, which is a country in Africa that just got done with a, revel, uh, uh, a civil war. So in fact, the government can't go in the north half of the country because they get shot. Um, and what we were able to do uh, with some of our colleagues, because we opened this up to a lot of different universities to work on, is we were able to make a map of poverty in this country that we could renew every week. Right? In other words, you can see the places that are getting rich, are pulling themselves out where the babies are not dying quite so quickly, and you can see the places where they're dying more quickly. And you can do this every week, and you can do it for free, because it's just a little bit of data crunching. That's a really different thing. Now, you've heard a lot about, big data is scary, it's kind of like, you know, okay. can also save babies. And there are a lot of people who are, you know, the statisticians for the OECD, the people who are trying to plan development interventions, that would love to have this data, and that's what we're working with. Because we'd like to save the babies. We like babies. Here's something that's even more interesting. So we had to publish this, if we can get it to stop. There we go. So this is part the Nature Communication, one of the leading uh, scientific journals in the world. Okay. This is data from three companies, uh, cities, 150 in the US, 150 in the EU. And along the bottom is this idea flow the banging together of ideas. And the way you compute that, it's very simple. You look at the density, the number of people per square kilometer, 
And you look at how far they travel, the transportation infrastructure. Okay, and from that, it turns out you can calculate how many people have lattes together or work together or play together. You know, it's, it's statistical. That's not completely precise. But if you tell me about this, this idea flow, I can tell you the GDP of that city quite precisely. Now, that's interesting. It accounts, in one case, for 90% of the variance. In social science, that's like a law of nature, okay? You know? But listen to what I did not tell you. I did not tell you about education level. I did not tell you about specialization. I did not tell you about capital investment, at least not directly. I did not tell you about class structure, sort of Marx and sort of analysis. I talked only about how ideas bang together and produce innovation. And from that, you can now predict GDP. It also turns out you can predict patenting rate, you can predict crime rate. Turns out crime is a form of creativity. Uh, <laughs> obviously, from the ideas banging together, you could produce things like, you know, HIV infection rate. Different sort of thing, right? But same mechanism. Um, and that gives rise to some of the things that are the real promise of big data and social physics, this understanding of how people and cities work. at now, and this is work that's ongoing, is how can we design cities more banging together of the idea of the text. So I showed you, if you'll remember, poor areas in terms of this idea flow. They don't mix with each other or with areas outside. Places with poor idea flow have low GDP and the babies die. Not good. Places that have Good idea flow, they mix with the communities around them, they have good communication and flow inside, they're wealthy, the babies don't die. So, why don't we design a city to have good idea flow? What an idea, <laughs> okay? So, the way cities are designed today is like this. Oh, go back. All right? Like this. This is Shanghai. Some poor guy. <laughs> folks had to like build little models out of wood of every skyscraper in Shanghai. And they got this thing the size of a football field that has all of the cities, and this is how they plan their city. If you want to put up a new building, you build a, like, a little wood thing, you stick it there, and people look at it and say, yeah, it looks good, all right? <laughs> all right, well, that's how it's done. But uh, some of my colleagues in our city science thing have built this. So this is, uh, this, the buildings are built out of Lego blocks, so you can change them and you can move them very easily. It's all very interactive. And then it senses where these buildings are, and it will simulate physical things like air, you know, uh, moving through and sunlight. But you can also simulate idea flow. You can say, how likely are people to mix in this part of the city? Is it people from far away or is it just the locals? And what that means is you can begin designing a city for creativity. You can design a city that has the minimum number of ghettos possible. And I think that's a pretty good idea. You can actually make something where the sources of innovation, the mixing of different people, are good everywhere and maximized overall. That's a really different way to thinking about it. And it has to do with focusing on the social fabric rather than on the individuals. An economist would not tell you to do this in a city. Locke, John Locke, would not tell you to do this because they're focused on the individual, whereas I'm focused on trading of ideas and interchanges between people. Okay? So, give you an intuition. What do some of these social physics ideas tell you? Well, it tells you that there's a lot of examples of good and bad design in cities in the past. So these are little villages that are just north of Switzerland and Germany. And they're very, um, they're walking distance, everybody knows each other. In terms of this um, idea flow, it's the case that, you know, if I talk to you and I talk to you, you definitely talk to each other. There are no secrets, okay? 
And that has a following effect. It makes, and also, they don't talk to the people far away because there's no good means of transportation until just recently, right? And so what that tells you is that everybody is on the same page. In other words, there's very strong social fabric, which you would probably experience as being stifling, but is actually pretty good for kids because there's a lot of social support. It's probably pretty good for other parts of society, but it's really bad for innovation because everybody's thinking the same thing. They're in this echo chamber, right? Ideas just go round and round, same ideas. Everybody says the same thing. There's no innovation there. But there is social support. Now, what would happen if I took these and I stuck them together so that there were these different communities of practice, as it were, different sets of habits, but now they could bang their ideas together really well because I connected them, say, with a, a transporter so that they could visit each other really easily. What would that do? Well, that would have both this engagement that brings social support and the exploration that brings the banging ideas together that brings the innovation. Do we have an example of that? Yes, we do. This is an example. This is Paris. Paris is full of little villages. They're called arrondissement. Boston is built the same way. Little villages, and then you put in a subway and other sort of transportation. And guess what? The villages talk to each other, and you get a flowering of culture and innovation. Now, if you pack too many people in there and the, and the transportation system gets overloaded, it begins to break down, and that's sort of where we are today. But it gives you a sense of where we need to go. And so the things we need to do is we need to think about better transportation infrastructure. Electric cars, I'm on uh, the advisory board for Nissan, uh, just down here in the valley, and we're building the world's first commercial autonomous vehicle. And I helped design the first one, which never got to uh, commercial uh, uh, use almost uh, almost 20 years ago now. It's just in Japan, so you never heard about it. You only heard about the Google car. Uh, shared use vehicles, folding electric vehicles, you may have heard of them. They come out of our lab. Again, it's uh, Ryan Chin and, and Ken Larson that led that and Bill Mitchell. So that's one thing we need. The other thing that we need is we need to be able to share ideas and share with ideas. So physically meeting is good. That's important. On the other hand, you also want to be able to trade stories, facts, things like that. And that raises a real question, because a lot of the things that I showed you here are evil in the wrong hands. I mean, you can imagine having you know, this mixing of people stuff in the hands of Assad in Syria. What would he do with that? Just think about that for like two seconds. You don't want that. Right? <laughs> so you want to have something where um, you can get the good things from this big data. You can have the babies not die. You can build creative communities. But you want bad guys not to be able to use it for their purposes. And that's really the tension. Okay. And so for the last five years, I've helped run a conversation at Davos between people like you know the chairman of Vodafone, the chief justice minister for the EU, the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, people like that, about this tension between the public good and protection of the private. And also companies have to make money because they have to, they're the ones that help collect this data, right? So if they all go bankrupt, that's not so good. We don't want them to take over the world, but you know, they, they cannot go bankrupt. And, and the nice thing about this discussion is that there is a consensus that's emerged about what to do about sharing of information that gets at the fact, the feeling that we have that we're being spied on, the fact that the NSA goes like way overboard, and I don't think anybody was really hurt by it, but you can imagine in a different country or a different time it would be really bad. And the consensus is that you have to put people, let's see if we can make this behave, no, I guess not, can we go back to the last slide? Uh, that, mm, one more. There we are. Good. OK. I'll put this down. This one. <laughs> OK, let's see. OK, one more forward and then one more forward. So the consensus is um, that the only politically viable solution is to put people more in charge of data about them. 
So there has to be notification when people collect data about you. You have to be able to see that data. You have to be able to, it cannot be used without you having informed consent, which means you understand what the data is, you understand what it's being used for, and you believe that it offers value to you, and only then do you give your consent. Now that's what we do in human subjects law. When I run an experiment, that's the US federal law. You have to ask people informed consent, and it has to offer some level of value to them that they're willing to accept. And they have to be able to opt out. They have to say, you know, I thought it was a good idea. It's not. I opt out. And the data goes away. Those are the principles. And those are enshrined in the US Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, which is put out last year and is moving forward. It's uh, enshrined in the EU Data Protection Acts, which are moving forward. We're going to get there. It's going to be a battle. And everyone says, well, what about Facebook? Well, what about Google? Well, a lot of the internet companies were, grew up in a completely unregulated environment, and it's going to be very hard to argue that they should change their practices unless you can show concrete harms. And so what the regulators want to do is the following. They want to take regulated industries like telcos, like banks, like hospitals, and they want to hold them to a very high standard with respect to privacy and giving individuals control over their data. Because after all, those industries are not only regulated, they're licensed. You know, if they don't behave, you can pull their license. And guess what? They're going to behave. They'll kick and scream, but they will behave. If the regulators can then show that these very high levels of control, personal control over data, still results in a viable ecology, something that's good for the people, good for the public, good for the company, then they can go to the Facebooks of the world and say, Ahem, you know, these guys are doing it. Why aren't you doing it? And they've already started to do that. There's a lot more scrutiny, a lot more pressure. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's beginning to happen. In my group, we've built software to try and implement these principles. It turns out it's not that difficult. Some companies do this automatically, like AT&T does it internally just to make sure that they don't violate the law. It's that cheap. So we've built software that helps people do that. And we've spun up living labs, which I think is a very important concept. All this stuff I talked about, and all the other things that you hear about, are in one sense theory. Now we have lots of data about them, we have evidence. You really shouldn't believe anything until it works in the real world with people. The proof of science is engineering. You have to be able to build things that really work. And so, can we go to the next slide? So what I've been doing is building what I call living labs. For instance, in Trento in Italy, which is an autonomous region, which means they don't share the national debt with Italy. You know, good man. Um, we convinced them to work with the telcos and the government to give their citizens control over the data that these companies have about them. And the idea is, is that by giving people greater control and a method of auditing what happens with their information, that engenders greater trust and greater sharing. And that you can audit it and you can go get the bad guys too, right? Okay? And so that's the theory and we're trying it and we're going to see. Because too much of this discussion is driven by fear. You know, I, I like to make a joke whenever I hear a bunch of lawyers talking about things. You know, there's always a point in the conversation where they say, yes, but if the Martians come, then they'll take things over, right? And then, you know, guys, the Martians aren't going to come. Calm down, right? You know, but that argument doesn't work real well unless you see actually And the Martians did, in fact, not come, okay? So that's what we're doing. And at MIT, we're turning the MIT give the students, the faculty, the people who are part of the community control over all the data that all the data that their cell phone carrier that they has in a way of asking what would the world look like if people really controlled their data? What would be the advantages? The goal of this is to be able to build an environment that's far more innovative by allowing more ideas to bang together. And that's pretty much it.
So thank you. <laughs>